Hi, in this video, we're going to start talking about chapter five, which is about integration. <clears throat> integration is the second half of what's considered pre preliminary calculus. So far, we've been talking about differentiation, which is essentially taking derivatives and using them. And integration is the other half, and it's reversing the process. So at some level, we'll talk about how can we go from a derivative backwards, but there are a ton of applications that work in different ways. So section 5.1 is very quick, but it just gives a bit of motivation. So here's a question. Is there a systematic method for finding the area of a region defined by a familiar function? So for example, what is the area in the first quadrant bounded by the x-axis, the vertical line y, x equals 2, and the parabola y equals x squared? So just as a quick picture, This is sticking on me. Yeah, good enough. So here's y equals x squared, familiar parabola. Here is the vertical line, x equals 2. And we're thinking about this region. So it's not a triangle because one of the sides is curved. You've learned a lot of area formulas, area of a triangle, area of a circle, area of a rectangle, area of a trapezoid. For the most part, they involve straight lines. Or in the case of the circle, we have something that's so perfectly round. But here we have this combination of straight lines on two sides and this curve, but not a circle on one side. And you haven't learned an area formula for that. But using something called an integral, we'll be able to figure that out. So the idea is we already know, for example, how to do areas with straight lines. But using integrals, we'll know how to do areas with curves. Or another example for exa uh, would be something like, uh, imagine distance. If I tell you you are traveling at a constant velocity of 20 miles per hour, and ask you how far you went in three hours, that would be a very easy problem. So going from velocity to distance with a constant velocity is a very easy problem. Probably did that in middle school. With integrals, we can do the same thing with varying velocity. So what integrals basically do is they allow us to use a really clever limit process to take these kinds of computations we've been doing all along, types of areas, types of distance problems, averaging things, work, work from the physics point of view in terms of calculating energy, um, volumes, I don't know if I mentioned that, but a lot of things that you've already done in really limited examples, integrals allow us to do with a wider variety of functions. So we're gonna jump right into section 5.2 about what's called the indefinite integral. So I'm just going to point out this word integral. Sometimes we'll talk about the integral, but we really should distinguish. There's something called an indefinite integral and a definite integral. And they are related, but not the same thing. So do pay attention. What we are learning in this section is called the indefinite integral. And I'll explain why it's indefinite as we go on. So here's our definition. We say the function capital F is an antiderivative of a function little f if big F prime equals little f. So I'm intentionally calling them two versions of f to explain how similar they are. So the idea is the derivative of big F is little f, which means that the antiderivative of little f is big F. So it's just reversing the process. When I go in one direction, I am taking a derivative. When I go backwards, I am taking an antiderivative. And what I'll point out is any continuous function has infinitely many antiderivatives, but they would all just differ by a constant. So in this case, we would talk about the general antiderivative. 
So as an example, let's look at this function f of x equals 4x. So we want to think about what are some functions where this is the derivative. So you're sort of thinking to yourself, big F is this function. I take the derivative and I get 4x. So maybe it would occur to you that, oh, 2x squared works. But if you're clever, you might think, oh, well, 2x squared minus 9 also works. Or 2x squared plus 11 thirds. There are lots of functions that have this property, but it turns out they're all basically the same, except for what we add. The idea is derivative measures steepness. If I tell you the complete story of the steepness of a graph, I've fully described its shape, but you still get to shift it up and down. So what we would do is we would say that the general antiderivative we would say that is 2x squared plus c. And we would almost always use the letter c here. The idea is c stands for an unspecified constant. So this is our abbreviation for saying 2x squared plus whatever number you want will work. So rather than list all of the numbers, which is impossible, we just describe the pattern by putting in a plus c. When we do this and get this general antiderivative, general because I'm not telling you specifically which function this is, we call that an indefinite integral. So basically, general antiderivative and indefinite integral, you can think of those as synonyms. And we have a notation. So the way we would write this, and let me say it first, the integral this is called an integral sign. It's derived from an old fashioned way of writing the letter S. The integral of 4x dx is 2x squared plus c. So basically, here we're saying this is the antiderivative problem we're trying to do, and this is the answer we get. So this notation goes back to the beginning of calculus. It's a rather awkward notation. Try not to think too much about independently what does this integral mean and independently what does this differential dx mean. You can basically think that when we're doing a definite integral, we begin it with an integral sign and we end it with a differential. And in between, we put the function we are trying to anti-differentiate. So later on, we'll unpack a little bit what these are really doing. But you can basically think that they're bookends. We begin with the integral, we end with the differential, and whatever we put in between, that's what we're taking the antiderivative of. So you'll remember we spent a lot of time doing derivative rules. General rules like quotient rule and chain rule, but also just learning the derivatives of lots of specific functions. So because you already know so many integrals, I'm sorry, so many derivative rules, you already understand a lot of integral rules because it's the same relationship backwards. Um, so I'm saying here you must know certain basic integrals. It's just assumed you can do these quickly when we move on to doing problems, but they are derived from differentiation that you know. So what I would strongly recommend you do is pause and try to figure out as many of these as you can. Uh, depending upon how I roll things out, maybe you did a lot of these on a worksheet already, so you might want to just compare, check your answers, but pause and really do this. All right, so I hope you have done that. So let's just take a look. If you ever see no function, you can think there's an implied multiplication by one. So here we're basically thinking, what's a function whose integral sorry, whose derivative is one. Well, the function x has a derivative of one, and we make that general. So that's x plus c, right? Really, I could, I, it's okay to put equals here because this is saying what is the antiderivative and it is x plus c. The next one does the power rule, but backwards. So we know when we take a derivative of a of an exponent of a power function or a monomial, 
the power goes down by one. So if we reverse that process, it goes up by one. But if I were to take the derivative of this, the n plus one would come in front and I'd have to cancel it out. And again, we make this general. Right, so just to make this one a little more concrete, if I were to ask you the integral of x to the fourth dx, that would be one fifth x to the fifth plus c. And you could check if I take the derivative of one fifth x to the fifth, I really do get x to the fourth because the five and the one fifth will cancel. Integral of cosine would be sine. Now you'll notice I changed the name of the variable, but by default, the variable name and the differential better match the variable name in the function. If they don't, it means you have to do some more work. So it's not wrong if they don't match, but it means you're not ready to do the problem. So it's something you want to notice. Antiderivative of sine would be negative cosine. So here, for these problems, be really careful, right? Derivative of sine is cosine. Derivative of cosine is negative sine. But integral of cosine is sine. Integral of sine is negative cosine. With these problems, slow down and get it right because it's really easy to make a sine error if you're just doing things on autopilot. Again, we're turning some of these derivative rules backwards. So hopefully you just remember that secant squared is the derivative of tangent. You remember that e to the x is its own derivative and therefore it is its own antiderivative. Let's do this one, a to the x, and let's make it concrete. Let's suppose I wanted to do the integral of four to the x dx. And we can do this kind of with guess and check. We know that more or less four to the x is its own derivative. If I have y equals four to the x, we know the derivative there is the natural log of four times four to the x. So there's this natural log of four I wanna cancel out. So what if instead I revised this and divided by the natural log of four, which is just a number. So what would I have here? There, the constant one over natural log of four in front then natural log of four times four to the x. These things cancel and y prime is four to the x. So the general rule here is that it's one over the natural log of a times a to the x plus c. So we had this rule that says when we're working with a base that's not e, there's this extra multiplier that makes things a little awkward. When we're taking a derivative, we multiply by that thing when we take an integral, we divide by that, this thing. You will have a lot of problems where you're practicing this. It might feel like busy work, but you want to do these enough times that they're more or less ingrained. You don't wanna be scratching your head trying to figure out an integral when the writers for the AP exam, for example, assume you know it and, can, or, and know it within 10 seconds. Right? There are things you're supposed to know within 10 seconds. If you spend four minutes to figure them out because you don't know them, it's going to be really hard to be successful. Okay, uh, going back here, you might notice I said if x is not negative one. If you try this, oh, sorry, n, yikes, good thing I went back here. If n is not negative one. So you might notice if we tried this with n equals negative one, we would wind up dividing by zero over here. So there's one exception of this power rule for integrals, and it requires just remembering what's the function that has one over x as its derivative. And hopefully you remember that's natural log of x. And here, I want you to get in the habit of saying natural log of the absolute value of x. This is a superior answer because this function is defined for all non-zero x. If you just said natural log of x, you're coming up with a function that's defined only for positives. So generally speaking, you want to give the fullest function possible. If you give a function that makes no sense for negatives, you're limiting yourself. So the better answer here, just develop this habit. Integral of 1 over x is natural log of the absolute value of x. OK, these last two. With fractions, sometimes you'll see the differential written in the numerator. 
this is the same as this. So we're sort of treating dx as something we're allowed to multiply by. And again, you just have to recognize these. You need to recognize that this is the derivative of inverse sine. And this one below here is the derivative of inverse tangent. So everything on this list, you need to just plain know it. These are derivative rules backwards, but don't put yourself in a position where you have to figure them out every single time. But also don't guess. If you're not 100% sure, make a temporary guess and see if it has the derivative you want if it doesn't revise. All right, now, we had various rules about how derivatives were more or less easy when we throw some wrinkles in. Same thing is true with integrals. So derivatives were unaffected by addition, subtraction, and multiplication by a constant. And these rules still work with antiderivatives. So for example, if I needed to do the indefinite integral of x to the fourth minus 5x squared plus 8 cosine x, I can break up the addition and the subtraction, and I can move out the constants. So what I could do here, now I'm going to write an intermediate step that explains my thought process, but is not what anyone would actually write out as an intermediate step. But I could say, all right, I have these three terms. I'm going to do an integral minus a different integral plus a third integral. And moreover, these constants, I can move them outside of the integral. So the idea is, okay, I know how to take the integral of x to the fourth, so I'll do that. I know how to take the derivative of 5x squared, and the 5 doesn't really make the problem harder, so I can think of that as outside the problem. Similarly, 8 cosine x, the 8 doesn't really make anything harder, and I know how to do the integral of cosine. So if you know these rules, this one is 1 fifth x to the fifth plus c, and I'm going to say c1 for a reason, minus 5 times 1 third x to the third plus c2. So the idea is every antiderivative has an unspecified constant, but you don't want to give the illusion that it's the same number every time. When I do this antiderivative, there's some constant. When I do this antiderivative, there's some constant. And when I do this one, there's some third constant. But the way we would write this is we would say, OK, at the end of the day, I have a constant minus 5 times a constant plus 8 times a constant. And I don't know what any of those constants are individually. So really, the way we would present the answer here is 1 fifth x to the fifth minus 5 thirds x third plus 8 sine x plus just one constant. There's a different constant from every part, but we don't know what any of them are. So when we add them together, we just get some constant and we don't know what it is. So typically, once you get good at this, you will not have to write out these intermediate steps. Just we have this pro thought process of I deal with the terms individually. I can don't have to worry about the constants, just leave them in front. And if you can get straight to this, that's great. So. Let's just kind of point out here. Addition, subtraction, multiplication by a constant. These things were easy when we were combining functions and taking derivatives. They remain easy. So they're just kind of along for the ride. If there's a coefficient in front of something, it remains in front of your answer. If you're adding, you do them separately and add. Now, I will give you a huge warning. Integration, generally speaking, is harder than differentiation. And that's because there is no full equivalent of the chain rule, product rule, or quotient rule. If you find yourself dealing with a product in an integral by just taking integrals separately and multiplying them or dividing or something like that, 
It basically means you are inventing an integral rule that no one else has known about in the roughly 350 year history of calculus. And so that means there's the overwhelming chance that you're just making up a rule that doesn't exist. So just flag this now. There is no chain rule for integrals. There is no product rule for integrals. There is no quotient rule for integrals. We will learn some tricks here and there that we can use some of the time to deal with problems that remind us of these things, but there is no rule like the product rule that works for every single problem you want to do. However, we can deal with multiplication and powers and chain rule stuff and quotients if we can rewrite. So get in the habit of rewriting things if you don't know how to do them. So let's look at this example. This feels like chain rule, right? Something squared. There is no chain rule for integrals. But we can roll up our sleeves and just foil this out and do it like that. If you take x, plus, x squared plus 1 and square it, that's what you get. Now, I'm going to flag something here. Technically, in a really detail-oriented way, what I've written here is wrong. You would never get taken off for it, and sometimes I make this mistake. But strictly speaking, we kind of think of this as multiplication. So if you want to be really clear, anytime your function involves addition or subtraction, it should really be in parentheses. Very, very, very minor issue. OK, and once we've written it this way, though, we can just use our rules. There's the Oops. Here's the antiderivative of x to the fourth. Antiderivative of x squared is 1 third x to the third. But it's getting multiplied by 2, so we really have 2 thirds. Antiderivative of 1 is x plus c. In the early stages, I highly recommend you check by taking a derivative. And you can check that, yeah, this is x to the fourth plus 2x squared plus 1. There we go. Here, this looks complicated. Let's move the d theta over here. And I have 1 over cosine squared theta, which hopefully we just recognize as secant squared theta. And then hopefully you remember, oh, secant squared, I just learned. right? Just, that's just a fact I have memorized that secant squared is the derivative of tangent. So if I'm doing an antiderivative, I have tangent. Over here, this looks like quotient rule, but there is no quotient rule for integrals. Please do not think that you are the first person in history to come up with one. I have seen lots of students just try stuff, and it doesn't work. So rewrite. If you don't know how to take an integral of something based upon how it appears, try to change its appearance. And we actually did something similar with derivatives before we learned the quotient rule. So you could break this up. And then when you simplify, our first term here is 6t. Our second term is 1 over t. And we know how to do these. So this would have a t squared and a 1 over 3. But then with the 6, you get, uh, sorry, 3. Yeah, sorry about that. I think I misspoke, but trust me. You can, you can check what's the derivative of 3t squared. It is 6t. Remember, 1 over t is this exception to the power rule. You need to just remember that it involves a natural log of the absolute value of t. OK. A um, couple more things here. In this section of the book, they introduce what are called slope fields and integral curves. We're going to address this later. So this is important, but we'll learn more about this later. It's essentially a visual representation to understand how integrals and curves and things are related. And another topic that we'll see a lot more in the future, but it is rolled out here, is what's called a differential equation. So a differential equation is an equation involving the derivatives of a function. And these are hugely important. Engineers and scientists use differential equations all the time 
because many natural phenomena are best understood in terms of their rate of change. So we actually start with knowledge about the rate of change and work backwards to figure out something else. You might think about gravity. Gravity is a well understood physical law. And gra the law of gravity basically tells us what force is and force is proportional to acceleration. So laws about gravity are basically telling us facts about acceleration, which is a rate of change. If you want to actually know where something is, you start with that rate of change of acceleration and you work backwards to figure out something else. So when we talk about a differential equation, its solution is a function. So if I give you an, a normal equation, and say, oh, what's the solution to x squared plus 1 equals 11? Your solution would be a value, a value for x, maybe multiple values for x. But for a differential equation, the solution is a function that makes the equation true. And if we can give a specific function, that's called a particular solution. If we describe a class of functions, that's called a general solution. So let's look at an example here, and I'm going to add a page. So you can just watch this first one. Oh, and I added it in the wrong spot. Oh, OK. So example to watch. Find the particular solution. I copied this poorly of the derivative of f equals 3x squared minus x subject to the initial condition f of 1 equals 1. So basically what's going on here is I am telling you that the derivative is 3x squared minus x. So we want to think, what is this original function? The solution is the function. What function am I thinking of? Not what number am I thinking of? What function am I thinking of? So we would do an antiderivative. So you could probably just do this in your head. Antiderivative of 3x squared is x cubed minus, because the subtraction doesn't make any harder, antiderivative of x, or x to the first. You can use the rule. We bump up the power by 1, but we need that reciprocal. But there's a plus c here. So I know the general form. This would be a general solution. Any function of that form makes this differential equation true. But we are given this additional information, often called an initial condition, that also has to be true. So also, we need that f of 1 needs to be equal to 1. So we can plug that into what we have here. It would be 1 cubed minus 1 half times 1 squared plus c. So that looks like 1 minus 1 half plus c. And f of 1 is supposed to be equal to 1. So I'm just plugging in, and that gives me an equation I can solve for c. And you can check that c equals 1 half. So we now have what's called a particular solution. We have the very specific function. Again, for a differential equation, the solution is a function. Here is the unique function that makes all of the elements of this problem true. On the one hand, the derivative of that function is 3x squared minus x. And on the other hand, it satisfies the condition f of 1 equals 1. So this would be our solution. So take a moment and try this one. Find the particular solution of dy d theta equals sine theta plus 2 cosine theta, subject to the initial condition f of pi equals 10. So pause and try this. Okay, so I hope you tried this. So right away, we can think what's the general solution. If the derivative is sine theta plus 2 cosine theta. So remember, you can do this in parts. The antiderivative of sine theta is negative cosine theta. 
If you feel like you're remembering this wrong, just pause and say, what's the derivative of this? The negatives cancel. The two as a coefficient is along for the ride. The antiderivative of cosine theta is sine theta. And then a plus C. So this is our general solution. And here I'm using the names Y and F kind of interchangeably. That happens, right? Y is sort of our go-to function name, as is f. So now I want that f of pi is equal to 10. So if I plug that in, I have negative cosine pi plus 2 sine pi plus c. So what do we have here? Cosine of pi is negative 1. Sine of pi is 0. So I have. 1 plus 0 plus c is equal to 10. So it looks like c equals 9. So let's just present our answer. The function that makes that true, I'll call it y again, would be negative cosine theta plus 2 sine theta plus 9. These are relatively easy differential equations. We will be seeing examples of ones that are trickier that we solve with different techniques. And just to get you thinking about that, here we have, if I tell you y prime equals y, can you think of a general solution? And I'm not going to give you an answer here, but let's be really clear. This is not saying y prime equals x. Right? That's easier because we, that's just asking for an antiderivative. If I tell you the derivative in terms of the variable, that's a more straightforward process. Here, I'm telling you the derivative in terms of the function. So for this one, you might recognize, oh, this is basically saying the derivative of the function is the same as the function I started with. Maybe you can think of an example. Maybe it's a little harder to think of a general solution. Right? Just because you can think of one function that makes that true, can you think about all of them? And later on, we will deal with other kinds of differential equations um, where the derivative is explained in terms of the function. This is a tricky problem. This is a tricky problem. Just in contrast, y prime equals 1 over x is easy. y prime equals 1 over y is hard. y prime equals 3x squared is easy. y prime equals 3y squared is hard. It's much harder when I talk about a derivative in terms of the function as opposed to the variable because we can't just take an antiderivative. We have to do something clever, and it's coming up in a later section. Okay, so I think that is all that is in this section. We've already talked for, I think, half an hour, so we will stop this.